You're listening to the Elvis Ultimate Fan Channel Podcast, the channel that is devoted 100% to the life and career of the biggest selling recording artist of all time, with your host, Steve Francis. Hi everyone, welcome once again to Elvis the Ultimate Fan Channel. Larry Geller is an American writer, hairstylist and public speaker. He was a spiritual advisor and personal hairstylist to Elvis Presley. He was the person in whom Elvis confided in matters of the spirit. Larry first met Elvis in 1957. It wasn't until 1964 that their paths crossed again and he became a full-time employee with Elvis. It gives me great pleasure to say Larry joins me on the show today. Hi Larry, you're very, very welcome to Elvis the Ultimate Fan Channel. Hi Steve, I'm really excited to speak to you today and it's been so many years since Elvis left us physically but thank God his music his memory and the wonderful movies he left a body of work but most importantly the impact he had on our civilization goes deeper and is more profound than any entertainer that ever lived. And so uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to expressing and sharing some memories, and I've got a lot of them. <laughs> great, great. Um, actually, you're based in Sedona, Arizona, so that's uh, an Elvis connection straight away, isn't it? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, Elvis made a movie here, and... Um, he loved this area, and um, yeah, so I've been living here for, for seven years, and uh, I, well, actually, I was born in New York, and when I was seven years old, my family, and I moved to Southern California at the age of seven, and I grew up in West Hollywood, mm-hmm. which was quite a place to grow up. Uh, especially in the 1950s, which was a great era for everyone. The Second World War was over, there was prosperity, and so many new things were happening in the entertainment world, in movies, and then, of course, in 1956, Elvis came on the scene and changed the course of music, of history of clothing, of style, of many, many things. And I was in high school during that period. And the minute I heard that voice, I became a fan instantaneously, just like probably you and everyone else is listening. Yes. And one day, one one of my closest friends said to me, hey, Larry, Elvis is coming to town, and he's going to give a concert. Well, in those days, Steve, there weren't rock concerts. You know, we take all that for granted today, and it's the norm. It's We all have been to many, many concerts, but back then, it was brand new. And I said to my, my best friend, his name was Christian, I said, we've got to go see Elvis, we've got to. I want to meet him. So I belonged to a club, and six of us went to this auditorium. It was called the Pan Pacific Auditorium. This is 1957. And when we got to the auditorium, there were thousands of kids our age coming in from all directions. We never saw this before. It didn't exist. And we were just amazed. And you could just feel the electricity in the air because they all came to see Elvis. But we were so naive. We didn't know how it worked. We didn't have tickets. For some stupid, naive reason, we thought we would get in somehow. Slowly, everyone entered the auditorium. And a few of us uh, stragglers we're outside, we're looking at one another, and we realize, wait a minute, we're not, to, we're not going in. 
So my buddies and I, we ran to the far end of the building because we knew the building. They used to have like boat shows and auto shows. And we used to go there. So we knew the place. So we went and tried to yank open a door. <laughs> we went to another door and tried to, it wouldn't work. And we ran to the far end of the building. And I said to my buddies, I said, and I pointed, I said, look, look, there's Elvis. And about 15 yards away, um, I don't know if you know yards. Yeah. Uh, okay, good, good. Elvis was standing with about four or five guys around him, the bodyguards. I said, come on, you guys, let's, there he is, let's go meet Elvis. And I looked at my buddies, and yeah, Steve, they were frozen stiff. <laughs> and I could say they were, they were petrified, and I knew it. I said, well, I'm going, you guys, I'm going. And I ran up to Elvis. And at that time, I was still in high school, I didn't uh, reach my full height yet. And so I was much shorter than Elvis, who stood, you know, around six feet tall. Mm -hmm. Good height. I ran up to him. And when I got to him, he looked at me. And I'm looking at this face, the hair, the sideburns, the eyes, the whole. And he was just like burning energy. And he had a glow about him, and he, a big smile came across his face. <laughs> he saw that I was dumbfounded. He put out his hand. He said, hi, I'm Elvis Presley. I was stunned. I, and I started to stutter. I said, ha, ha, hi, hi, Elvis. I'm Larry Geller. It's so great to meet you. And we're shaking hands. And the minute that happened, one of the guys that were with Elvis said, Elvis, you're on, man. They want you now. Come on, come on. We got to go. And Elvis very nonchalantly looked at me, shrugged his shoulders. He said, well, you heard what they said. Got to go. Talk to you some other time, kid. And he walked off. Man, that's some first meeting, isn't it? <laughs> I am telling you, to say your world was rocked, yeah. that was something else. I was in it. I was in the Elvis zone, and I remember people coming up to me, shaking my hand. Some girl put her arm arm around me, and I just I couldn't believe what just happened. So, about six months later, I graduated high school, and I entered college, and I was taking um, English and theater arts. And my best buddy, Christian, said to me one afternoon, he said, Larry, come on, man. What, what are you going to do with your life? You're taking, what, three units? I'm taking 17 units. You go to school twice a week for a couple of hours. What are you going to do with your life? I said, Christian, I don't know, man. I really don't know. I'm reading a lot of books. My dad was in show business. And I love to be in show business. Maybe I can become an actor. He said, well, you know, maybe you will, but it's very, very difficult. You need a trade. You need something to fall back on. You need to make some money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're very artistic. You're good with your hands. Why don't you think about becoming a hairstylist? You could work in Beverly Hills. You work on those beautiful women just imagine a woman you'll meet. And I, <laughs> I thought about it. So I dropped out of college. And I entered uh, beauty college in Hollywood, took the course, and I already had a job lined up in a great salon in Beverly Hills to do women's hair. So I took my state board examination. And as I'm waiting for the results one afternoon, I'm walking down the street and where I lived, and I saw this very interesting looking stained glass window, and there was no sign on the door. So I was curious, and I walked in, and I looked around. It kind of looked like a beauty salon, 
So the fellow introduced himself, and his name was Jay Sebring. I don't know if that rings a bell with you. Yes, yeah. Uh, And I introduced myself, and I told him I'm going to be a hairstylist. What what kind of a place is this? Maybe I can work here. He said, well, this is, I'm opening next week the very first men's salon for men in America because it didn't exist, Steve. In those days, for like $1, men would walk into a barber shop, have their hair cut, walk out with the same greasy hair they walked in with, <laughs> and, but their hair would be shorter. And he said, look, I'm, we're gonna, I'm gonna style the hair. I'm gonna shampoo the hair first. I'm gonna do something that's never been done before. Larry, don't become a women's hair stylist. Join forces with me. We'll be innovators. We're going to start a revolution. And I said, it sounds great. I'd love to. So we opened the the Sebring International in West Hollywood. I answered the phones. I swept the floors. I did everything and learned how this man was cutting hair. And within two weeks, I picked up on it immediately. But the interesting thing is, Steve, right off the bat, even though this was an experiment. We, our clientele, read like a Hollywood's who's who. Frank Sinatra came to us. Paul Newman, Marlon Brando, Steve McQueen, Peter Sellers, Roy Orbison, Glenn Campbell, every major star in motion pictures, television, recording they came to us that, that that's some that's some list isn't it that's like who's who of hollywood <laughs> it was a who it was a who's who yeah and most of the movies of the 60s and television shows that's our work and i was doing henry fonda's hair peter sellers glenn campbell a lot of very very interesting and i was 19 years old and things were going very, very well for me. And to move the story forward, because we got to get to the most interesting part. <laughs> now it's 1964. I'm 24 years old. I have a fantastic clientele, and I'm making money, and I'm creating hairstyles. I'm, I'm going to the MGM and Paramount Studios, and it was really, you know, for a young man at that time and working with all these famous people was tremendous. So one afternoon, it was in April, 1964, and I'm styling someone's hair and my phone rang and I answered it. And on the other end, I heard a Southern drawl, you know, um, uh, and this fellow said to me, oh, Larry, I'm, I'm sitting here with Elvis Presley. And the minute I heard that name, my, my hair stood up. Yeah. <laughs> he said, um, and he wants to know if you'd like to come up to his house here in Bel Air to fix his hair. And those were exact words. And I said, I'd love to, because, you know, Elvis was then the celebrity of celebrities. Mm. Elvis was the biggest star in the world. Now he's even bigger. Now he's beyond icon. Elvis was the king of rock and roll. And not only that, he was a movie star. Who did that? I mean, this was something else. So I packed my bags because uh, uh, the fellow that worked for Elvis, his name was Alan, Alan Fortis. Yep. yep, and Alan was a good guy, passed away, of course, many years ago. Uh, he told me where someone would meet me at the Bel Air Gates, and I'm running out of the salon, and the receptionist said to me, Larry, Peter Sellers is on the phone. He wants you right now. 
I said, tell Peter I'll call him later. Steve, I didn't care who it was. <laughs> it didn't matter to me. It could have been the President of the United States. Or that I, Elvis, I had to go. So I drive up, and when I drove on Elvis' street, I saw his house immediately because there were flocks of people of all ages everywhere in the street, and I drive in, they start yelling, tell Elvis I'm here, tell Elvis I love him, you know, all that. So I walk in to Elvis' house, and as I walked in, I looked to the right, and there was a, a little kitchen uh, room where Elvis was sitting with about five or six guys, and he was wearing a motorcycle cap, and it was a duplicate of the one that Marlon Brando used to wear when he made the movie The Wild One. Oh, yes. And Elvis pointed and he said, hey, man, I'll be right with you. So someone brought me into the den and I'm standing there, I'm looking around. And about 30 seconds later, here comes Elvis with that same dynamic energy just burning off of him. A couple of guys behind him, he walks up to me, just like he did eight years ago. He puts his hand out. He said, I am Elvis Presley. I'm having a flashback. Yeah. And I'm thinking about this little skinny kid. Hi, oh, Elvis, you know. And now I stood six foot two. And I'm looking at Elvis directly into his eyes. I said, hi, Elvis. I'm Larry Keller, and it's great to meet you. And he said, well, come on. Let's go into my bathroom. You can take care of my hair. We'll talk. Mm -hmm. I said, great. So Elvis and I went into his bathroom together. And an interesting thing happened right off the bat. I expected, you know, a big... Uh, beautiful salon chair and light bulbs around a mirror and all that kind of, you know, that I've seen many times before. But it was a very plain bathroom. But it was big. It was large. And it was a little basin. And Elvis said, come on, we'll do it right here. He was very casual about it. He just put his head down. I quickly put a towel around his neck, poured some shampoo on his head, turned the faucets on and rinsed, you know, lathered his hair and began to la uh, rinse it out, the lather out. And I'm being as careful as I can. I do, certainly do not want to get him wet. You know, in the salon, I had someone do that for me, but of course I knew how to do it. And so I'm doing that and I'm all, almost finished. And all of a sudden, Elvis picks his head up and starts shaking it back and forth and water is splattering and it's hitting me. His shirt is getting drenched now and he looks at me and he starts to laugh. He says, hey, Larry, what the hell, man? At least it's clean. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, that was a seminal moment for me because I knew right then and there, this man is so for real. You know, <clears throat> I, you know, we were working on Warren Beatty and Rock Hudson and, you know, the biggest stars in Hollywood. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them want you to know who they are. Mm -hmm. They have this ego they have this armor. Elvis was wide open. And I could see, if you would ask me to say in one word your impression of Elvis, well, there's a lot of things I could say. Multi-talented, handsome, this, that, and the other. But the one word to me, for me, would be vulnerable. This man was so vulnerable, and he was always open. At any rate, 
he says to me, come on, we'll do, we'll do my hair here. And he sits down in a chair in front of a long mirror, a long marble ledge. And he explains to me that he started to make this movie called Rost About. And he said, Larry, you know, you, you, you can't cut too much off because, you know, the scenes have to match. I said, Elvis, believe me, I know. Uh, just let me let me do what I do. He said, okay, man, I'm going to leave the driving to you. And I started to do his hair. And it took me, I would say, about 35, 40 minutes to cut his hair, to dry it, blow dry it. And so I'm looking at him in the mirror and I'm kind of cupping his hair. I said, what do you think? And Elvis looks and he said, beautiful, beautiful. And he spins around in the chair and it began. He pointed his finger right at me. He said, who are you, Larry? He was serious. Who are you? What are you really all about? What are you really into? Now, during that whole time, I did Elvis's hair. He never said a word. And I didn't either. And I respected his space, his privacy, and I knew if he wanted to talk, I'm right there to engage. But I was waiting for him. This is his place, and I'm there to do a job, which I did. So when he said that to me, that was shocking. And I'm thinking to myself, what in the world is going on? You're in Elvis Presley's bathroom? You just did his hair? Elvis's hair? And he asked you, and I, and I had to answer him. I said, well, Elvis, El, and I started to like get a little self-conscious. I said, I hear what you're asking me, Elvis. I mean, you know what, what I do for a living. And I go to the studio. I have a lot of clients that are, you know, actors. And I named a few of them to him. But I hear what you're asking me. And to tell you the truth, because i got to speak the truth to you, what's more in, important to me than my job or anything else in life is to find out the purpose of life itself. I mean, why are we here? What are we doing? Why were we born? Where are we going? What happens to us when we die? And look, Elvis, I read a lot of spiritual and religious books of all different cultures, ancient and modern, all religions. I don't care. I just want to learn. And I read a lot and I meditate. I became a vegetarian. But Steve, you got to remember, this is 1964 we're talking about. And our culture, our civilization, was in a whole different mindset. Today I can talk to you or anyone else about it. Turn on the television. Go to the books. This is what people are reading. This is what people talk about. This is in movies, on television. It's accepted now in those days. This was a little bit weird. This is uh, this is fringe stuff mm -hmm. on the borderline. And when I said these things to Elvis, all of a sudden I realized, oh my lord, I just said a mouthful to Elvis Presley. <laughs> I said, and I got really self conscious. I said, wait a minute, Elvis, wait a minute. I want you to know, I know who you are. You're the biggest star in the world. This probably sounds corny to you. He said, whoa, 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 wait a, minute. wait a minute, Larry. You have no idea how I want to hear what you have to say and what this means to me. I, these guys around me, man, they're great guys, but they, they're not interested in anything like this. I have no one to talk to about this. Please keep on talking. And I did. And the gates opened up. And we got into a conversation where I told Elvis about my family and where I came from. And he started to talk to me about his childhood, where he was born, his mother and his father. He said, 
Larry, you have no idea where I came from, man. I came from poverty like no one can believe. I was born in a shack, a two-room wooden shack that my daddy built with his own two hands. You know, I don't take my life for granted at all. You know, people walk into a room and they want to turn the light on, they flip a switch and the lights come on. <laughs> we didn't have electricity in that shack. Can you imagine that? He said, you want a glass of water? You can, <laughs> we didn't have faucets. We didn't have running water in the house. We had a well, a, a water well outside that my mom and my daddy had to go out to bring in. He said, man, I was born in such poverty. He said, did you know I had a twin brother? And I said, yeah, I did, Elvis. I know about that. I have twin sisters, and they told me all about it. He said, Larry, what would have happened if my twin brother, Jesse Guerin, what if he would have survived because he was stillborn? What if he survived and I didn't? Would you be doing his hair right now? What if we both made it? Would we be called the, the, the Presley brothers? Larry, I have questions just like you do, man. He says, why? Why me? Why me? Why was I chosen out of all the millions and millions of life, not only to survive, but to become Elvis Presley, to have the life that I have? This conversation was really something, Steve. Mm. And I realized a couple of hours had gone by. I mean, I can't go into all the particulars now because yeah. I have more to tell you. But it was one great, profound conversation. And you know what it's like if you meet a, a, a someone, whether it's a, a male or a female, and you hit it off. Yes. You just know this this person's so cool. Mm -hmm. I like this person. You know right away. Well, that's what happened. We Elvis and I clicked. We both kind of sensed it. And I said, Elvis, look, man, I, I, I love talking to you like this, but I've got to get back because Peter Sellers is waiting for me. I could come back, do your hair again. We can talk, you know. He said, Peter Sellers? I love Peter Sellers. He's my favorite. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Elvis started to imitate Dr. Strangelove in that movie. <laughs> And Elvis was really good at it. Elvis was, I mean, this guy was multi-talented. He did a Brando, by the way, better than anyone I've ever seen. At any rate, Elvis said, Larry, you know what? I got a great idea. Go back to the salon. Only tell them that you quit because you're going to be working for Elvis Presley full time. What do you think? And I didn't know what to think. I mean, I was doing so well. And a very interesting point here is that in a couple of months' time, I was going to open my own Sebring salon in Palm Springs and do Kirk Douglas and Frank Sinatra, because they lived down there, and a lot of other people. I was going to have my own salon. But I was with Elvis. When he said that to me, it just, it was so right, and I knew it. And I said, yes. He said, Larry, here's what I want you to do, man. I want you to be at Paramount Studios tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock in the morning. You, bring, you meet me there, or you bring me some books. I want to get into those books you have been telling me about. So what he was, and I knew what he was really saying, <laughs> you accepted this position to become responsible for the likeness and image of the biggest star in the world. In movies, album covers, all the graphics, personal appearances, which is something that is heavy duty that I never 
lightly. Mm. But he was asking me something more significant, more prof- more profound. He was saying, "Bring me the books." I knew I, I knew what he was really asking me. He wanted me to introduce him to a whole new uh, spiritual, intellectual area of life that he was ready for, that he wanted to explore, he wanted to grow. And that was one of the hallmarks that I remember about Elvis. He never stopped growing as a person, emotionally and intellectually and spiritually. He grew. He was always a spiritual, phenomenal person, but he deepened and he blossomed as time went by. That's all for this week. There will be more from Larry next week, including the full story of the Beatles' visit to Elvis's home in 1965, Larry's relationship with Elvis's manager, Colonel Tom Parker, and much, much more. Larry's books, Leaves of Elvis's Garden, The Song of His Soul, If I Can Dream, Elvis's Own Story, Elvis's Search for God, and The Truth About Elvis, are all available on Amazon, and you can find the link in the description box below. I hope you can join me next week for the second part of my interview with Larry. Until then, stay safe and thank you for listening to Elvis the Ultimate Fan Channel.